Newcastle's there, Billy Head, the goal, Chris Billy Huddersfield Town. The most famous goal of Chris Billy's life. Is this the moment for Lee Fowler? It is. Take your place in Division 2, Huddersfield Town. Rupi and Steve Simonson's boots now. He's missed. Steve Simonson clears the frame of the goal and collapses in a heap of tears. Huddersfield Town are promoted. Stephen Schindler has a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend. And he takes that chance! Now, everybody, have you heard? Town won a game, thanks to Danny Ward. A good point at Luton, with more grit than style. And if you've got a thirst for podcasts, don't turn that dial. Welcome to episode 118 of Ye Old Faithful Andy Takes That Chance podcast. Questions were asked of Huddersfield Town last week and answers have been forthcoming. A rather good week in HD1 as Town take four points. As usual, we're here with the latest talking points from the last week. So, two, spread our ear pollution, both far and wide. We've kept your contributions by your side and... Okay, that didn't come across as well as what I thought it might do. A couple of strokers on this podcast as well, I think. Right, myself, Matt Squire Shaw this week. Uh, say you're a winner, man. You're just a sinner now. It's Richard Cozzy Kosmala. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, good, Matt. Four points in the week. Can't argue with that. Well, we could if you get six, but we'd settle for that, wouldn't we? Last Sunday, we were saying, weren't we? This time next week, how will we feel? So, yeah, and here we are. Good. It's good, man. With Cozzy and I, as a man who always puts his emotions in motion, it's Dan Pozzaporit. You all right, mate? Yeah, not a bad evening, gents. The face of Huddersfield Town, sponsored by <laughs> Utility and Energy. I know. I can only see his teeth at the minute in the dark room. Pause is on every... Honestly, the club and pause is... Pause, how much are you getting paid? <laughs> you don't get paid, mate. That's the problem. You just get it ground about eight hours before kickoff. Uh, yeah, yeah. They'll let you <laughs> in with key. Is that employee, is that employee, isn't it, that when you turn up to open up, he's sat there on the doorstep? <laughs> Uh, right, so uh, with Cozzy and I and Dan, uh, we have a very special guest. He's here, he's there, he's every chuffing where. No, it's not Jonathan Hogg, but a man as equally as ubiquitous in his nature. Wherever there's a town podcast, he's like the wind and he's always there. It's David Hartrick. How are you doing, Dave? It's quite nice to be called a special guest instead of just Stephen Chicken's sidekick. That's going to in the world now. You used to be the trick to the chick, but now you're, you've broken out in your own rights, I think. Yeah, well, you, we all grow up one day. We all hit puberty one day, don't we, Matt? Well, It'll happen to waiting. you soon Still enough. Waiting. Waiting. Yeah, Dave, if you stay on long enough, you get a job at an EFL club, you know, I hope so. Come back for a few more episodes, mate, and we'll get you a job at Burnley. For Burnley? For Burnley? Bob. I know. I know some of you don't, but no. Nah. Oh, this is going to go wrong, isn't it, this podcast episode? I can feel it. <laughs> I feel it already. It's already gone wrong. Uh, right, so Magic Rock. Pozza, what have you got out there? Yes, mate. Uh, as always, the uh, podcast is sponsored by Magic Rock, and they were very kind to send uh, a couple of the old town lagers out uh, this weekend to me and Cozzy. Uh, just sampling one now, and very nice it is too. So if you want to get your hands on some, uh, you can log on to their website and use code AHTTC10 uh, for 10% off. And if you want to try it, uh, obviously it's been sold down at the ground and also in the tap room um, up at Burkby. I think it's probably the best one for a match day. Uh, open before matches and afterwards still around about 11 o'clock. So, yeah, cheers to uh, Magic Rock and uh, very nice it is too. Thank you. Very good. Nice wrap. Right, so Luton Town nil, Huddersfield Town nil. Uh, history is often our greatest prescience, if you like. So last week we looked at some of the recent trends and we had some concerns moving forward, didn't we? Uh, the Forest and Swansea games felt very second half of last season in their nature. Uh, but the latest two have maybe quashed our worries on several levels. And we'll have a look through some of that uh, just now. 
Uh, our questions about going behind haven't yet been answered because that's not happened in the last two games, which has been good. Uh, but there's no questions over the discipline, organisation and commitment of Towns back three. Uh, just looking very carefully at the the three there, Tom Lee's Nabisar, Matty Pearson. Tom Lee's eight clearances, three block shots uh, and a tackle um, or no tackles because he didn't need to make one. Uh, phenomenal in a very unphenomenal way is, is how I'd describe Tom Lee's. Nabisar with seven clearances, Matty Pearson six. Dave, how good is Tom Lee's? Uh, I think he's excellent. I think um, when I, I, I wrote a piece on him last week for Yorks Live and just talking about how he's sort of quietly become town's best defender, really, and it's backed up by our player, player ratings in the examiner and also the fans' player ratings, um, where he is, I think he's second to Sorba Thomas. No, he'll be second to Lee Nichols now after yesterday. Sorba Thomas will be in third. And you dig through his stats and there's nothing particularly exceptional there, but you realise that's because he, he doesn't really need to make tackles. He just, his positioning is really, really good. I think he's only made in 600 odd minutes of football. I think he's only made five fouls. And Town, as it stands, have only conceded seven with him on the pitch in his 600 odd minutes um, compared to, you know, Nabby's played played far less football bless him and they they've conceded 11 with him on the pitch and he's just he's just really really good really really efficient with the ball you know one of the things he's really good at is is passing he's got the third highest pass completion rate in the entire squad um top is Dwayne Holmes who has has only played 100 odd minutes of football compared to nearly 700 from Lees and the player in second above him is Jonathan Hogg and Jonathan Hogg's pass completion is always pretty high because it's a lot of the time he's taking the ball from the central defender and it's going back 10 yards to to a wide player or to a central defender again so he's he's averaging second highest clearances which is a bit deceptive because they're not clearances it's him that's often trying to hit the diagonal He's just a really quietly efficient footballer. And you have to, like, you ha sometimes you have to take your hat off to the club and say on a free transfer now, that looks an absolutely superb piece of business, doesn't it? Oz, you used to play centre-back, didn't you? What, what are your thoughts on Tom Lees? I like him, as, as Dave says. He's, he's sort of never does absolutely outstanding. And sometimes you'd, you'd struggle to actually... You know, after a match, describe what he's done because everything just seems to come almost like sort of natural. He's never, oh, what a great tackle because he's been caught out of position and he's had to, you know, make 10 yards and, and sort of last ditch. His, his positioning is good. Um, yeah, he's, he's one of those players that sort of goes probably unnoticed a little bit. Um, I think, he's, as Dave says, for a free transfer, he's been a great addition. I know there were some concerns at the start of the season when he came in. Um, you know, on, on Twitter and social media, people started making the comments of if you're going to play out from the back, Tom Lees is, you know, maybe not the first choice for that. But um, from what I've seen of him, he's, he's very solid. Um, and yeah, he's, he's not bad uh, in opposition box either, with, you know, on a set piece going forward as well, which is, which is good. And, I think that back three now is is pretty solid. Um, you can you can rely on them. Obviously, Naby is the maverick of, you know, the one out of the four that would play there. Um, and you know, I still have a little bit of concerns about it about Naby, but I do think if he does play with Lees and Pearson, they rein him in a little bit, and he can probably get away with his maverickness um, mm -hmm. because you've got two. I would dare say old school centre halves that are next to him that can that can maybe sort of mop up and uh, and do what they need to do. So fantastic signing, and, and as it's gone so far this season, you know, um, you know, he's up there for player of the season so far. Cosy, how does he compare to those uh, Spanish defenders that you love watching so much? And you have some Sheffield Wednesday and Leeds mates as well who may have given you a mixed opinion on Tom Lees as well. What what how you know what expectation did they set to you, and and how has he looked in comparison to it? I liked him, Matt, to be honest with you as well. I'll be disappointed when he signed for town because that means no more free tickets for Millsborough from him because he got me uh, so many. But big friend of Lee Bromby, so I think when he came in, a lot of the criticism, oh, you know, another Bromby kind of guy in, he's 34 years old, a lot comparing him maybe to Keo and Stephen, and we've had his kind of fingers burned, haven't we, really, we old kind of, should I say, past it centre half. So my hopes was just really that he'd have, you know, plenty left in the tank and that as well. And yeah, it's early days, and I think what shows the, the quality of the guy really in that as well is, I mean, 
to be fair, he couldn't do much last week at Swansea, but he would kind of, you know, turn for the goal. But he was a great bit of skill and he came, he comes back. He, he's just one of those players I like, Matt, in the fact that he just kind of quietly gets some of the job, really, and that as well. And Dave will probably have more inside knowledge than me on what goes on the training ground. He seems like the kind of guy that will come to me, well, obviously been captain at, you know, kind of Hillsman and, you know, highly thought of as at Leeds as a leader that he's going to come down the drive canal side, put his handbrake on, get his gear on and kind of be a real leader to some of them kind of young guys that we've got in the squad. So really, really good. And again, it's just like anything in it with, I suppose, at any age really, but it's just keeping him fit. And uh, yeah, it's good. And, and it's ironic, like Paz, you said, it was a lot of Wednesday nights. One of them was saying, oh yeah, you know, don't ask him to bring it out, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, that's been one of his best bits really in that as well as like kind of Dave mentioned there with the, with the stats. So yeah, Really, really good, but it's like anything, isn't it? When we sign a guy from Leeds, you've got to, I mean, obviously, being a long time at Hills, but he's got to win a lot more over than the crowd, plus through his age, plus through the the kind of the steam and keel of kind of, oh, God, is he passed it, what, free transfer journey, man, et cetera. And you can't argue, mate, it's been brilliant. His, his whole thing is he just wants to be available to play football. That's That's his whole attitude so as soon as he knew he was being released in the summer he started working with a, a coach and a physio because he had a injury and he wanted to get himself fit for the start of the season despite the fact he didn't have a club and he's just a very impressive individual as I said he's just when you look at someone like Levi Colwell you think well if you want to re- role model Levi of someone in terms of attitude and what they do on the pitch then really at the moment, Tom Lees is, is, is the way to go. He's just a very dedicated professional. And I think there's 34-year-olds and 34-year-olds, isn't there? there was, he, he's not a defender who's thrown his body on, it, on the line for sort of 15 years. So he's, he's still in very, very good nick. He's still very, very mobile. He's still very good on the ball. So, yeah, just, just a good player, you know. And, I mean... I know that sounds a, a sort of almost damning with faint praise, but that's that's what you need in the championship. You need to be able to look at sort of five or six individuals in your team and go, well, yeah, he's just a good player. I don't think there's enough love in the room, is there, for, uh, for Tom Lee so far. It's been an extraordinary start. And the reason why I mention him is because he stood out to me in that first half against Luton. Uh, Luton were knocking on the door, so to speak. And, and Tom Lees was one who, who really stood up to that onslaught. You know, Harry Cornick was putting good balls in from the right hand side and, Amari Bell was getting down the left and Pearson, uh, Tom Lees and Nabisar were, were almost, you would almost say rock solid. There was that one opportunity for Amari Bell where he really should have scored. But aside from that, Lee Nichols balls, was Matt, I'm take you to task there. Their balls were horrendous. And I, I, I think, didn't they have 21 crosses or 31 crosses in the first half? Dave, you probably have the stats for it if you are not some other, but they were horrendous. I, it was almost like they were a 60 mile an hour Gale Force wins. We got, I thought we got lucky there. they they, they put so much forward, but they were poor and we'll come on to their commentary in a bit. I'm sure we, w- we will do. But mm. the one thing that they were mentioning compared to obviously saw the game on Wednesday when they smashed Coventry is that the, the balls in was so much better. I thought we got kind of lucky there. They were they were awful, really, weren't they, with some of them crosses? Yeah, but I, I think that... <laughs> I think, I think more than anything, though, before you sort of drill down into the game or look at anything... It, it's it's just championship football this season that w- you can play well on a Tuesday or Wednesday night and you can play really, really badly on a Saturday. It's just every team in the league is doing this. And I mean, I, I'm a I'm a little bit, um, to be brutally honest with you, I'm a little bit on Cozzy's side here. I didn't think their final ball was great. And yeah, it was, I think Town stood up pretty well, but I think one of the reasons Lee's probably stood up to you, Matt, is because when you've got Colwell, Saar and Pearson as defenders, they all quite like committing. They all like coming out and committing to the tackle, to the header, to clearance, whatever it is. Mm. And when you do that, it's quite nice to have a presence like Lee's in the middle, who's a little bit more calm and who takes up that cover position just behind continually. And I think that's why it goes under the radar sometimes. You don't quite realise the sort of protection Mm. he's providing all the time. And when you have a team who are crossing it like that, sometimes it's just, you know, I thought I thought Town did okay, if I'm brutally honest with you. I thought they set up not too bad at all first half. We had, me, you and Stephen Chicken had contrasting <laughs> views on that first half, didn't we? I, I didn't think it was very, 
It's it's interesting. I think that maybe moves on the the conversation a little bit earlier as well in regards to the rear guard action. I I, I think when crosses come into the box, they've got to be dealt with, and that's the first and foremost of of any sort of defensive unit, if you like. And and we did that well. There were a couple of decent ones. I thought six yard wise, you know, Amari, like I say, Amari Bell's hit the post from a from a corner cross. A couple did whiz across, um, but you know, a lot of a lot of things came in. Uh, in terms of the rear guard action. This this has come about really as Town are quite slow to get into the game again. Um, the question really is: Is this intentional by design, or is it a case of Town being under the cosh or getting in, getting the initial lineup or tactics wrong? Maybe um, Preston, Sheffield United, Stoke, Blackpool, Forest, Swansea, and Luton. That's you know those games we were all quite slow out of the blocks in that. Um, also, five out of the six away games we've been quite. I wouldn't say penned back in all of them, but we have come out a little bit slow and tentatively. Um, the earliest goal we've scored this season, thanks to Liam Wobshaw on, on Twitter for this, was uh, 36 minutes. Alex Vajaco against Blackburn. That's the earliest we've scored. Uh, we've not scored in the first half hour, obviously, all season. Uh, four goals in the first half and 12 in the second. Is it is, is this just a tactical quirk by design? I, I can't work it out, really. Uh, or is this just, or yeah, is this just, is this just um, how it's going? It was interesting, Matt Nathan Jones made a comment about that as well. So he was kind of saying he saw it as a, he said those who were scared. I think that were his words, to be honest with you. He said he spoke to some of our coaches down after we were scared. And, you know, where we kind of maybe dominate possession, he felt they were like a model victory for them that, you know, kind of they dominated possession, certainly in the first half and that as well. But I just think, I don't know whether you think too, my kind of thought process coming into it, and then like Dave saying, you can't, you know, one championship game and another, but they come in on, on, on a great result. Obviously, we did, but I just think going down there, the weather were horrendous. It's it's one of those we know kind of they're pretty direct on that as well. And it was almost like we let them kind of do what they needed to do, to do really and that as well. And I just think think it got to a point, I think we texted each other, Matt, didn't we? That were like, if this carries on, you know, there's, there's only with one winner. And luckily, that you know, the guy did the post from, from no yards out. But I don't know. I just think sometimes, I think they came into it on a roll, they put... They kind of stamp their authority on there. That that's what made it. I mean, we'll come on second half later. What we but it's like that's what made it more surprising to me that I just thought there's only one way this is going. But but then your head tells you this is championship. Surely we're going to play a better second half than we did. But yeah, I just think sometimes you've just kind of got to say yeah, they're at home, they're on the front foot, they're off the back of a you know a big win and what have you and that as well. But but realistically, what what did Nichols have to do when all said and done? I mean, even that it's the post, not the shot and target, is it? But he did it. He had nothing to do. But so I thought. Yeah, they had the ball, but we didn't, they didn't like doing much to me. Like I say, though, this is this is sort of five out of six, isn't it? Because uh, it's not it's not really a criticism either. It's more of an observation of of how we're how we're lining up. Pause. Um, just let us know what have you made of what have you made of it? I'd, I'd, I'd argue it's more by by design um, from what I've seen so far. It's it's almost taking to to boxing, isn't it? You 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 go out rope and a dope, you know. get feel for your opponent and, and um, let let them come at you and. And let's let's defend and see what they've got, and hopefully by half time, sixty odd minutes, they're they're out of ideas, and we can then you know take a foothold in the game a little bit like the Sheffield United one. It I were, mm. I think that was probably the first instance where I really noticed it, and I was a little bit you know aggrieved that we were sort of sitting back and, and and not really looking for the win, and then we all of a sudden changed play on front foot, and you know we got into the game, but I think certainly away from home, if you if you come flying out of the blocks leave gaps in behind, uh, other teams are at home, they're expected to get forward, you know, all of a sudden you could be, you know, caught on the break yourself and, and within 20 minutes you're 2-0 down and it's a long way back from there away from home. So I don't particularly mind that uh, approach. Um, we've had chances before, you know, look at Blackburn, we missed two two really good chances really early. We came flying out of the blocks there for me against Blackburn at home. We were just unlucky not, not to get the goals. Um, like I say, away from home, don't, don't really mind that. Let's get a feel for the game. Let's get, get a feel for the tempo, deal with what we have to deal with. And in many games, I won't say as, as goal have been peppered. Even Sheffield United, they were on the ball, but they were mm. 20, 25 yards out with it. You know, a lot of sideways passing and, and crosses a little bit like yesterday. We, we dealt with them well. So... I, I would suggest it's it's more designed than being penned back. Um, I just think we need to probably be a little bit more proactive and, and probably a little bit better quality when we do get those breaks. Certainly, in, you know, sort of first half, we, we, we bring the attacking players into play. Um, I just think if they, they just need to deliver, certainly Karoma, he needs to be a little bit better. 
and supporting the, the front man. Um, I know we're going to come to talk on about Blackburn and Danny Ward, but when we get close to him, we, we are so much better. So it's just it's just finding a way to to do the things going forward a little bit better for me. But the the way that we set up and the way that we you know start the games, not no problem really. I say pause. That's it, it, those five games I've mentioned. We've won two of them, lost two, drawn one. So it's not not really bad. That's away from home as well, Dave. So that's not actually a bad ratio when you look at it. No, it's not at all. I, I think I personally think a lot of it is by design. I mean, like football games are full of variables, so you can't control everything. But I think the the Sheffield United win sort of convinced Corbyn that one of the best things to do is just try to get to half time any which way you can without any damage and then do the bulk of your work in the second half when you can influence it with substitutes and various other things. And I think while it's, it, it, I think town are historical slow starters. This isn't just a Carlos Corbran problem. This was a Danny Cowley problem as well. Town took ages to get into games it's slight. There's a slight mentality around the squad that they are do start a little bit fearful. But when you take them off the leash, like the Everton League Cup game, like the Blackburn game midweek, they can do it. It's it's just they're slightly risk adverse. Carlos Corbran is a slightly risk adverse manager as well, in truth. And I think that it's if it works, <laughs> you can't really fault it. And the thing I would say is. Luton are a really good side. They're they're a really they're tough to break down. They're tough to beat. They've got lots of goals in them. As a club, they're a really sound club. They they run really well. They do some fantastic things in terms of of off the pitch stuff. They recruit in the right areas and they spend money in the right areas. To come away from a point there is, I think, is absolutely fine. Absolutely fine because there's there's plenty who won't this season there's a few who already haven't so yeah i agree with that many people's shouts as a dark horse as well this year this year looting mm. for top six so you know it's it's a I, I was gonna say it's a great i thought it was a great point all in all um a really good point and second half i thought we came out and we made a really good statement second half we you know we've done this in quite a few games where we sort of the shackles come off if you like and Sorba thomas starts getting into the game josh caroma again had another good second half i thought you know he's, he's slowly getting back at certain points a little bit there are sort of it's, it feels a bit sort of two steps one one you know forward one back two steps forward one back with Karoma, which is fine at the minute uh, yeah, I thought, Matt, it was like I it was uh, premier league like watch it premier league gears later on in game on it were like uh, henry Lansbury, cameron jerome <laughs> god i yeah. thought brian steen were gonna come on <laughs> brian steen <laughs> uh, yeah i thought it's really weird isn't it though like jones has kind of got a real mixture there of players and i, I was kind of looking up lance but he's like 30 years old but he used to have been around forever, doesn't he? He's kind of lost his way. Used to have that way. big haircut as well, didn't he? Used to have that huge, yeah. big sweeping haircut as well back in the day. Yeah, but... you could see his quality, even though when he'd come on for like 15 minutes, he were like, come yeah. through. And he tried that audacious kind of yeah, shot thing, but he kind of fell over and, and that as well. But Taylor played well for us, and Matt, and I just think he needs to go. That Luton commentator we're getting on my nerves. I think everyone's well. Sinani, what a player, mate. Oh, uh, soliloquies, synoptic yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah, you know it, what? It's, what I like about him, especially on, on Tuesday, it was a horrendous miss, wasn't it? And and it's like you can tell he just wants a goal, and and I think he'll really kick on. But what I liked about it, mate, he didn't like getting down, and he goes again. We liked shooting on on Saturday, and there were long range. And honestly, that one, I mean, obviously we weren't there, but it'd be interesting to know just, anyone who's kind of. I bet the behind the goal thought it were in because it, it looked it, didn't it? it? Was so we didn't really get a good angle on the replay, but. Wow, it would a big hit. He's he's gonna get way me a lot of goals this year. I, I'm getting optimistic with this guy. Do you like him? Sin and I. I do. I think he's got something about him, mate, and that's well. I do like I do like the fact that I'd, town in my town history, we always think of oh, guys who don't really shoot much. We we don't mm. we like to score a perfect goal where this guy'll have a go and, and long may it continue. I think that showed a lot of character, mate, on yesterday on a sticky field at, at Luton to do what he did where on Tuesday, God, you know, I'm just thinking, oh mate, because I'm feeling for you, I want you to get that goal and and then it comes, you know, it's a good sign for him, mate. And knowledge people I know that support him, they, they really have high hopes for him. So if they come down, it's probably will do again. They'll, yeah, I think I want to take him back and do it well. But let's see, yeah. Can't do it. It's ours, isn't it? If we press the button, I think it's uh, he's, yeah, he's our wow. player. But there you go. Uh, so then, yeah, fair result. I thought this was a fair result. You could argue a Bell should have scored for them. But again, Tuffalo maybe when he's had that shot could have maybe squared it for Campbell. I think it's all horses for courses. Nil-nil, fair result, draw line. 
move on. What do you reckon? Yeah, they're taking it before, so yeah, can't go wrong with that. Especially after two defeats, like Cosby says, a uh, uh, four week, four points from the next two, one at home, one away. Yeah, you take it, and like you say, it's it's not a. It shuts us up a bit, uh, pause last week because we were probably. Yeah, I, th- I think it was more negative last week's podcast than what we wanted it to be at certain points, wasn't it? We weren't really trying to be negative. We were just trying to be objective and it probably came out a bit bit wrong in yeah. many ways. But this this kind of pipes us down a bit, doesn't it? I think not, not sort of that respect. I think it was justified doing what we were saying. I don't think we were being negative for negative sake. We, we, we are a town, a club that when we do start losing, we can quickly fall into a, a run of you know, bad form really, really quickly. So for me, certainly obviously Blackburn came at quickly came you know on the, on the midweek didn't have too much time to dwell on it and the way that we approached that game I thought were were really positive and, and really good um, so I don't know if old Carlos had a little listen to the podcast because he came out and did what we were asking him to do um, and it, it has gave me a lot more confidence now and, and hopefully everybody else that if we do have two three maybe even four you know not perfect results that we will come back from it whereas Certainly after Christmas last year, you had no law for that. Um, so, yeah, can't grumble at all. More than happy to make That's it. Matt, before That's the it. game, mate, let's be honest, if you did a stop all time, I said, bloody hell, no Viaco, no Og, looting away, peeing it down, that's physical team. You'd probably worry, wouldn't you? And I, I will, but Scott, I thought Scott, I did as, you did a decent job in there, mate. Well, this brings us on to our next thing. It's uh, I've entitled this Life Without Hog, and... Maybe life. Maybe that's a bit of a strong title, but we've well, there's two games here. We we look at statistically, Vaiko and Scott High have put in two good performances there. Vaiko excellent against Blackburn. Uh, Scott High, I thought had a really good second half against Luton Town. Prior to the game against Blackburn, we'd not won without Jonathan Hogg in the side since we beat Charlton four 0 pre lockdown. Uh, since then, we've had twelve games without him uh, in League and Cup, and we failed to win any of them. So it showed the importance Jonathan Hogg is to Huddersfield Town on this side, and he still is going forward. So this is not a bash hoggy session or anything like that. Jonathan Hogg will be massive to Huddersfield Town Football Club moving forward. He will, you know, he will he will be a big big figure for the next couple of years without a doubt. Um, but what this shows is this shows that maybe without Jonathan Hogg, we have we now have the players who can make us competitive and we can win uh, games. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh-huh. He will pass. The... Come on, pause. Join me. <laughs> Uh, you have to finish it. If you start something, Cosy, you have to finish it, mate. That's, that's not what we do on this podcast. Mate, that's why I didn't play a stick, because people could hear that song again. <laughs> Bit of ABBA. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but Lewis O'Brien, I thought it was, was fantastic in both games. I think it's worth pointing out Lewis, um, his performance against Luton as well. Five, you know, five tackles, three interceptions, some really good figures. I don't think you get running stats anywhere, but if you could, you would see the amount of ground Lewis O'Brien covered was phenomenal against Luton Town and Scott High. When Lewis O'Brien goes like that, he carries the ball forward. It, it, there's a lot of onus then on these midfield partner to to sort of plug the gaps in midfield. And I thought Scott High did fantastically well in the special in the second half of picking up second balls and just setting things going again. And I think I've, I've, I'm a big fan. Of, I'm a big fan of Scott High, and I think there's definitely totally a good future agree, there. Man. Especially when he got subbed off after about nine minutes on Tuesday, I thought his confidence would mm. be down. Uh, <laughs> let me just i tell you what let me just clear that up that wasn't rambo's fault no, it won't, it won't. they held, held up the wrong number and you did, yeah, it, did yeah. i tell you from from an analyst point of view because we have to report stuff back to opta straight away as it's happening and rambo's point of view it's the worst thing that can happen because it just makes you look you're you're so tuned in to just reporting exactly what you can see with your eyes it just makes you look a complete idiot so poor old rambo's pulling well i was going to say pulling scott high off he didn't go that far but uh (laughs) yeah he he was subbing scott high quite rightly because that's the number that went up and bless him it was Orba thomas who was actually going off you know what though dave there was so much carry on on tuesday by that touchline you had a better view than us Mm. but what were going on there, Mowbray? Pissing about and stuff. It was a shambles at times. And that would always come in with that, that kind of carry on there. I think the thing is, it was a very frenetic game and both benches were getting frustrated. The, the referee, I thought, had a slightly funny game because he let an awful lot go and pulled up other things he shouldn't. It was... There was a couple like that. So, for example, there was a couple of injuries that I think he could have let go instead of pulling them straight back and starting with an uncontested drop ball. And when you're a manager, that just drives you mad because you always see the situation developing 
a minute on, your team always scores the minute that whistle goes. So they were getting frustrated. And Mowbray in particular was, they were particularly annoyed by the fourth official and some of the things he was doing. And they was really mucking around with subs. There was, uh, Town had two ready and it took, I think it took about five minutes and three stoppages before he'd managed to actually get himself sorted and get them on. Blackburn had a couple ready and went through exactly the same thing. It was, awesome. I don't, I don't blame them because, you know, in a frenetic tense game like that, the last thing you need is like a fourth official who can't get his paperwork right and then drops the board at one point and then puts the wrong numbers up. It's just, it's those, those are the sort of things that wind benches up really. That's when officials don't really help themselves, if I'm brutally honest. Oh, Rambo's being defended. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's good to have, have Rambo's yeah. name clear again, isn't it? Though Rambo, yeah, no. we love you, Rambo. It's good. It's good. Know that both teams made four subs because at one point I was like, what, "What's going on here? Surely we've already had." Yeah. That's well, this question, isn't it? Yeah, this was it. That was the other point of of uh, everybody was wondering. I I clocked it straight away as a possible concussion sub, but then nobody could clarify it in the press box if concussion subs were in in the championship. Because there was then a question about, right, is is it just Premier League? Everybody was searched on their phones and laptops. So when you type it in, all you can see is Premier League. So I asked Dave at halftime, Dave Frelfall Sykes, who didn't realise it was a concussion sub. He went and checked with the referee. And not only did he find out it was a concussion sub, but then he had to go and report back that it's a concussion sub and you get an extra sub. So it was all, again, it was all like everybody was looking at each other for about 10 minutes before half time going was it was it was it it's a great role though i think that's a great role the brian even yeah yeah it's it's one of finally a bit of sensible rule changing 100 percent. but let's not lose let's look lose uh where we were as well so we'll bring on to the blackburn game as well but uh pause what what did you make of the the midfield performances then of of high and vieco and you know you, you you're someone who's looked at that midfield quite quite thoroughly recently haven't you but how, how did how, I'm, I'm tiptoeing around it slightly but uh how I can't be doing with people knocking on my door telling me how wrong i am again <laughs> <laughs> but no um as you say without hog um it is a different sort of three for me i think if you play Echo, O'Brien and Sanani, I think you've, you've got a good blend there i think the legs that hog gives you you keep with o'brien but you also gain that a little bit more forward um, outlook. Vallejo, um, and you know, really good, breaks, breaks up the play and, uh, and can get the ball moving forward. And then you've got Sanani as your, you know, like your main sort of attacking midfielder from the front middle there. So I think I think that three, for me, works a little bit better. There, are, there will be times that Hogg will work better in that three. Um, and I think it depends on your opponent. And I think if it's a little bit more physical in there, I think you need Hog, um, but O'Brien's not shy of a tackle. Um, he can get stuck in. So I just think you. I think with that, with we taking Hog out and playing Vallejo or High, I think you lose say maybe thirty percent through Hog, but you gain more playing somebody else instead of him. If it's a game that dictates that, so I think I think it works quite well. Uh, the you know that that little midfield three, and. Um, you know, I, I like a three-five-two formation anyway. So combine that with Pipper on one side when he is back, and Toffolo on the other side. Uh, and I think that that five across the middle with the three behind him, as, as we've already mentioned. You know, I think that's a really good, a really good unit. And then it's just your front three then, and it's just getting that to work a little bit better for me. As good as Thomas has been, um, he can't do it all by himself. Kroma needs to sort of step up a, another. 20, 30 percent for me, and then that central striker, as, as we've discussed at length, uh, I'm sure people sick of hearing us talk about it. But to me, Blackburn game really showed that if you can get someone as much stick as we've given Danny Ward, if you can get someone close to him or closer, like whether it be a Sanani from from the middle or the or the wide three, sorry, the wide two of the three, just tucking in maybe a, sort of ten yards a little bit. You can make things happen, and, and you know it proved, didn't it? The you know two goals, and that's certainly his best game um, since he returned. Even, even if you take the goals out, it, it were a really good performance from Ward, and it should do his confidence no end of good. Well, I think I think you're right. We mentioned that Linwood last week that you need to get people in that ten role, don't you? And Sinani came in 
really well. And I think that third goal, Dave, is is just a real highlight of what Danny Ward can bring when you get people close to him. You know, the ball's played into Danny Ward and he has got people in, you know, in close and he's managed to hold the ball up really well. And it's and he's laid it off and it's come to the right hand side. This is the uh, yeah, so it's come to Ollie Turton, hasn't it, on the right hand side? And he's put a decent ball in. And who would have thought Ollie Turton as a game changer ahead of Sorba Thomas? You know, Carlos, genius. And he's whipped the ball in. Toughlow's headed it back. Danny Ward's headed it in. Danny Ward's started and finished that move. And that's what you want from your number nine or number 10, whichever one you want to call it. But that is primarily what you want someone who can let, hold it, lay it off, and then get in the box. And it's a perfect piece of centre forward play. And the second, this first goal also was quite similar as well. Yeah, I, I think you could see right from the off that there was a huge difference in his game because he could look up and see a, another blue and white shirt. It was just as simple as that. There's been so many games this season where you can't defend his touch, but you could defend the fact that he was continually up against three defenders with nobody within 20 to 25 yards of him. And I think that ability to play off someone is is really what he's all about and how you get the best of him. And like I would... <laughs> In the five conclusions, all right, I, I wasn't going to bore everyone with a load of heat maps, but if you look at individual heat maps from the start of the season, like Danny Ward's in the middle, there's nobody else anywhere near. And then lo and behold against Blackburn, you can look at, go on sofa score and look at Lewis's, look at ba- basically anybody in the midfield or up front, and they've all got a patch in the centre because they were all trying to get closer to him. And you saw what the what a difference it makes. I don't think you can do it in every game, and I don't think Danny Ward can expect it in every game because there are going to be games like Luton where you do have to scrap and fight and push and parry. That is your job in the side. But in home games where you want to get on the front foot and you want to take something from him, just help him out. That's That's all it comes down to, just help him out. Because I think he's had a lot of stick this season, but I don't think anybody else would have done a better job. I don't think Fraser Campbell, Jordan Rhodes or Meepo would have would have done particularly a better job in some of the circumstances he had to play in. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I was really, really pleased for him, but he's got to keep it going. It's I just hope the international break coming doesn't stop his momentum again, because it seems like come towards the end of last season he was starting to play a lot better he got the goal against was it Coventry he got the goal um, and he was looking a lot better but then the season ends and he tried hard over the summer fitness wise came back with the, the least body fat of anybody in the squad and came back early as well like Sorba Thomas and a few others but yeah I just I just feel he's had absolutely no luck so I hope after the international break he he keeps going and they keep supporting him in in home games as I said you ju- you can't do it in every away game he has to do a different role there but in the home games the minimum you want is somebody within a knockdown from him really mm, excellent yeah uh, essentially the Huddersfield Blackburn game just the only thing I thought Cosy after that because you you were you were in the south stand for the first time since December 2019 yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? But, but what a lot of fun that game was. That that was my. What I came away. If, even if we'd have drawn that two all, I thought, you know what? I've really enjoyed that game. And I came. I, I, you know, skipped back to the car. It it was just a great game of football, wasn't it? And that's just what that's what you want to get out of your houses for and go and see. Just good football, thrills and spills, five goals. It was just just a great night, really, wasn't it? You were perfect, mate. I mean, it's where we at South and are right near pause. To be honest with you, you've got no trajectory. You're so low that it's like under sea level. So. The first thing when when Ward bashed that header in for three two, I looked at the linesman because I thought, I mean, it's impossible to tell. I just thought it, it felt he's like it's offside because there was no one near him. It just felt a weird thing and beautiful moment where he's flagged down. But oh, Matt, brilliant! There were like fourteen hundred Blackburn fans. There were a bit of uh, trouble after the game actually, and that as well. Uh, but that, <laughs> I think a lot of fans are just like letting off a bit of steam. But yeah, it was brilliant and. By Echo, I just, it's just like you mentioned there, Dave, we were kind of warning the international break. I just hope that this injury, I mm. just felt that was a coming of age performance for the sort of town on Tuesday night. I thought it was brilliant. The Fuenlabrada Busquets. His goal was brilliant, mate. It was a proper finish. They had a lot to do. And he just looked, he looked 10 foot tall, mate. He really did look good. And why well, you don't want to get carried away on what in effect of all it's 60 minutes or whatever, he, he kind of lasted in that as well. I just thought, wow, this is like, at last we've got a different option. I think O'Brien's been superb the last two games. It's really weird. I don't, I 
and a connection with a contract being signed or whatever. But he just, I thought he looked such a class player, especially yesterday at Luton. He was just sweeping stuff up, and you just knew that. Kind of, if you were a neutral watching this kind of to grab nil nil, you'd think, wow, this that guy looks a bit of a standout player. Played, in that. played like a captain as well, didn't he, O'Brien? I thought against mm. Luton. Yeah, he did. But Blackburn, mate, I I thought there. I mean, the debate on their second goal. Who was the guy that had the run? I just looked him up and the phone's gone a bit, he's gone off on that. Oh, Joe Rothwell. Joe Rothwell. Yeah. I just yeah. think sometimes, right, you just got to say that were class. That because was. when he got on the ball, he were like, he were very direct. I think it was O'Brien that kind of it pulled was, out yeah. the tackle. Mm. That's, where Ho- that's where Hoggy just yeah. goes through him, doesn't he? he? He had no option to do that. I thought it was brilliant what he did and he cut the ball across. That was just class play. And I think sometimes you just got to hold your hands up and say that were really good and that as well. But, Brett and Diaz on fire, isn't he? And that as well. I think the international things really kind of buoyed him and that. But even a seven million football again. I've been doing a little bit of research today, mate. Not quite Dave's standards, but but you can't be a mug of it when you kind of sign for that. So it's like I thought really good. And at two two, I mean I don't bet anymore. But if you're betting in play, there's only one team you're going to put your money on, and that's where Championship football just like makes you look a mug because I mean Mowbray said I thought they're going to win. I did. <laughs> I actually thought that would it with runners race and. What an, what an amazing ending and that as well. And Danny, what a man who's took absolute dog's abuse. And it was still a shame to still see some people give him his day, man. Mm. You know, like, I get people don't like certain players and what have you and stuff like that as well. But he was brilliant, mate. We're pivotal. The reason we won the game, in effect, and that as well. So just let him have his moment. It's like, he's still shooting, he's still not doing anything. He's like, bollocks, man. Just leave that out. And Danny Ward, class Tuesday, let's hope it's the start of something good. But call it as you see it. It was good. I, I, I had another guy who worked. Uh, Carlos, this is crap. This is off your seat stuff. I was like, mate, how can you not enjoy it? And I, and he was still not having it. There's some people that I get it that like anti Carlos, anti Danny Ward, but I just think you've just got to have an open mind on the stuff. It's like if you come in there and you're not enjoying that, then I think you've just got to do something different with your Tuesday or Saturdays because that's that that were enjoyable stuff, mate. If you want top quality, sexy football, Liverpool, Man City is your stuff. If you want like a nice, you know, kind of free flowing game, that's it. But Championship's always been like that. So he did frustrate me a little bit. That still some people couldn't take their agendas out and we're still giving it to Ward. I just like, no, mate. I think Danny Ward is let you know, king for the day, wasn't he? And let him let him be. So it's um, you know, no need to pull him down. But you know what? Let's have a look at the football forum. So this is after so what we do after uh, the looting game, we send out a tweet and just say, you know, let us know your thoughts on the game and we'll read out some of the comments that we get through. And with it being a nil-nil game and it being Quite a satisfactory point. We didn't really get many responses back on this. Seven, one, so. seven, yeah. So you know, it's not quite a record low or anything, but I think <laughs> it's a good sign when things are going well. People just tend to just sort of thumbs up and move on, don't they? So you know, it's not a bad, not always a bad thing. Uh, so yeah, Huddersfield Town family at HDFC underscore family says a point was probably better than the overall performance. We struggled first half and created nothing again. After the break, we didn't have chance. Didn't have. We did have chances, but didn't do enough. I'd have taken a point before, and plus Nichols got a clean sheet. So overall, happy with the point and work rate. How good pause was Nichols shithousing against Blackburn as well? That false dive. Unbelievable. But we were just- I, I'm starting to love this guy. The big easy, I think I called him on Tuesday night. It just makes everything just look so calm and easy, doesn't it? The ball comes in the box. And it's just, you know, feet up. You never, you never, I mean, we discussed Ryan Schofield at length last season, but that's what Schofield needs to be looking at and, and taking a lot of um, inspiration from from Lee Nichols. Because as you say, you, you never panic. As, as, as a fan, sometimes, you know, you see stuff happening and you think, oh, not any minute now. But with Nichols, you just have a little bit of a... Experience, though, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that helps the back three as well. We've, we've talked about how well they've done, but that can't happen if your keeper's not like Nichols is. Uh, I think he's picked up three bookings on it this season for sort of time. Yeah, people are panicking, aren't they? Oh, but, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind that at all, you know. The big easy. Uh, yeah. Danny Smith says, win at home and don't lose away. And you can't grumble too much, especially when we've had a stinker at Kenilworth Road in recent times. Uh, Gamer James FM says, great point at a ground we don't usually do well at. Four points was my target from the last two matches, so I'm definitely happy. Sin and I had a couple of good efforts. The first was agonizingly close. Psychologically, it's huge to be unbeaten in two heading into the internationals. Uh, yeah, and the... Right, let's take it with Tass, Matt. He would have do you want to, hang on, hang on, hang on. Do you want to do this? Hang on. Nope, hang on. We've lost to a pub side. We've literally lost to a pub side. Absolute you know, danger, this fella. <laughs> 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 
Jan Sievert in the crowd, a possible David Wagner six. All right, Cosy, I can you see you what, absolutely I get, champion I get, out I get in house <laughs> club, in house, I mean, ours is as bad as anyone, but I get in house club commentary and TV is going to be biased. I get that, but the guy just didn't seem to get the rules of football. It's like, <laughs> it, it like that's surely a yellow card for stuff, and it were like fouls and that. I couldn't believe it. It were embarrassing. I'll tell you what, he needed, mate. He needed a sidekick. He were on his own. He were, and it was just like, mate, it was it were woeful stuff. But in a way, you kind of think, fair enough, mate, you're biased. You know, you want your team to win and stuff. But there was stuff later on. They were like, that's got to be a foul. And he were going in there. It's like, mate, no. But the good thing is, Twitter, Twitter's a bad gauge for anything, in it? But I went on my own. There were a lot of people that were disliking him. Because uh, we're all watching these streams abroad. We were all abroad, weren't we, yesterday? Watching these uh, live streams. International beat, waters, yeah. of course, yeah. Yeah, mate, just got back from Gibraltar, but yeah, all good, man. What was his name, the guy commentating? I can't find his name anywhere. I'm, I'm surprised they've left him. No, no, but I'll tell you what, he could do it. He should have been binned off camera on a commentary and should have been used to clean the cameras, mate, with a cloth. That, that is, but That's what his job should have been in. Should have got someone else, mate. What's Nick Owen up to these days? You remember? Nick Owen, I'm yeah. old enough to remember all that. Yeah, and Ann Diamond. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was he was terrible. I will say he's, he was infuriating at the very best. He's, he's the, probably the most one eyed one eyed commentator you will ever come across. He was <laughs> he was appalling, yeah, appalling. But anyway, he's 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 obviously the, back in the danger zone. Uh, HTFC Dream says good performance, good point on the road. Wonder if Carlos to play Campbell away from home holds the ball up better, take some pressure off, bring others into play. Ward struggles at this. The only thing I'd say about that is the first half when it was a struggle, a lot of Balls forward were to nothing, really. They were into the corners, trying to turn mm. Luton, loot, loot weren't they? None of them really was directed to anyone. And I don't think Fraser Campbell makes much of a difference if you know defenders are smashing the ball into the far corners. I don't think anyone makes much of a difference there. But I do see, I do see the point on occasion that when you do have uh, a striker who's so far away from the rest, that's where you think, do you know what, we could probably do with a big, strong... Um, De Poitras shaped type, or you know, who could just hold the ball and allow well, the others to. That man match. I mean, it's a big no, ass young guy. No, not not at his age, I don't think. He he's more of a sharp striker getting in behind, but it's yeah, it's more that's... of a it's Wayne Allison who is you want get big Wayne out of get Wayne Allison get Wayne out of retirement. Bio didn't have his best game, Matt, but the qualities he shows that I just think you could tell why we were after him, mate, and he would give us something different. It's a bit that, sorry? Out on him, Adi Bay. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's decent. Yeah, we're decent. Played it out of the game second half, but first half. I thought, wow, if he were in our team, he'd just give us a bit of a different mm. dimension. And uh, Yeah, he was. He was pretty good, actually. It's, it's, I thought, Matty Pearson, this is what one of the things where I thought our back three were really good because when they were hitting diagonals into uh, Adebayo, Matty Pearson was, and Tom Lees were both using their shoulder just to nudge him and keep him off balance constantly. And he was the ball was sailing over his head. Mm. And it's those little unseen things that the centre-backs do when because mm. these are decent diagonals coming in. But the sail over his head, and everyone thinks, oh, that was a crap ball, but it wasn't. It's... Lees and Pearson been very clever with their, you know, with with the shoulders and elbows and levering him out of the way. And I thought they handled him very, very well in and around the box. But he did have a decent game outside the box, Adibayo, and we might have been lucky at one point. Last two comments. Uh, Adam Bell says, on our way back from Luton now, a draw was a fair result. We were desperate for the halftime whistle to be blown, but came out swinging in the second half. I think that's uh, very true and uh, well done to everybody who who made the journey to Luton and, and sold out the tickets. Um, decent following down there. And Jim Rushworth just said, good point away. And I think that pretty much roundly uh, brings that up perfectly, doesn't it? So, uh, yeah, so thanks to everybody for getting in touch. Um, that is the Football Forum, and we will be back live pretty soon, I think. Uh, but for now, it's uh, something different. It's a mad world. There you go, Cosy. You wanted this section, <laughs> didn't you? So, Cosy, championship. Poz, Poz summed it up best. It's incredible. Let me get this right, Poz. To correct me if I'm wrong. Luton, no wins in four. Coventry unbeaten in six. Luton five, Coventry nil. Fulham, unbelievable, man. Three, Bristol City won. Mitrovic on fire Wednesday night. So Coventry, Fulham Saturday dinner time. <laughs> Of course, yeah, Fulham are one up. No problem. It's going to form four one Coventry. Incredible, and this division's unbelievable. I just, I know we say it every year, but it even, good, West, even West great. Brom are folding. Yeah. Fulham struggling. You look at your bottom kind of three and, and four now, like Peter Barnsley. Maybe I suppose maybe Barnsley wouldn't expect to get there, but it's making me wonder what 
oh god, I've got to calm down, haven't we? I know we've had a good start, but it is a town lager, isn't it? It's brilliant, mate, isn't it? Because we know probably what's going to happen in Premier League, who's going to be in them top four. I think Roy Keane was saying tonight is that might be a top four now. Bloody hell, we can't say that at all in top six. Someone's going to get lucky again out there this season. And uh, long, it's brilliant, isn't it? If you get your recruitment right, just like we showed in 20, you know, 16, 17, and that as well, you you could have some fun. And uh, wow, I, I'm loving the uh, unpredictability of it. And so are my employers. <laughs> So we're getting loads of money in. <laughs> I bet they are. Oh, dear. But what's great, though, Dave, is I think by Christmas, I think we might see a top five emerge from, from what things are happening at the minute. I'm looking at the likes of West Brom, Fulham. Uh, Sheffield United have seemed to have turned, I know they're lost, but they've turned a little bit of a corner, haven't they, sort of performance-wise. Bournemouth uh, and Stoke, I think those those five look pretty well set, don't they? And they're, they've spent money in the right areas and they look quite good, but sixth place or one or two other player spots. It's just wide open. Even, you know, Derby, if they hadn't had that 12 point deduction, who'd have thought Derby would be swinging away in 12th, 13th, which they would have been without that. You know, it's, it's been a really interesting and decent league. I know people say, oh, the quality is worse than ever, but for me, the thrills and spills are better than they've been for a long time. Yeah. I, I <laughs> the quality thing is an issue though, because I think what's happened with, because of the COVID season, because of the restriction on finances, because of the various other things, there's quite one of the reasons I think you get these slightly mad results is that there's a lot of squads and there's a lot of first 11s where the, the talent gap is massive. And what I mean by the talent gap is that the gap between your sort of best player on the pitch and your worst player on the pitch, if it's massive, then it's an analyst dream, really, because you know exactly who to target. It was interesting that Blackburn tried to target Naby Sarr, for instance, um, right from the first minute. Um, I think one of the things that Town have done well with their recruitment over the summer is they've really closed that gap. They've managed to... You, you look at Town's bench now from game to game and you think that's as strong as they've had for since the Premier League, you know, comfortably. And they will continue to sort of carve their own path, I think, as a, as a, as a result of that. I will say I think the worst possible thing that could happen is Huddersfield Town being promoted this season because I just don't think it would do the club any good whatsoever at the moment. But, uh, but what it what the start does mean and what other teams doing what they're doing does mean is that the marker really should be come March, no Huddersfield Town fans should be looking at other teams' results to see how they're doing on a Saturday. It should be a nice, comfortable upper mid table season town are going to have more forest games at home and more Swansea games away. They, they, they just will do by the nature of this league, but they're also going to have a few more nights like Blackburn and a few more Saturdays like Reading at home as well. And that's absolutely fine. I mean, I've written so many times this season that personally for me, the mark for town this season is just to get somewhere in mid-table, but just try and have a bit of fun. You know, the 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 real change for me this season was the EFL Cup tie against Everton, which it was a shame it was such a small crowd because it was just a really enjoyable town performance, really enjoyable game. And the fact they managed to sort of carry that on into the Reading game and they've managed to recapture a bit of that against Blackburn in a home game, that's, that's great. That's where you want to... That's what you want to be your marker of progress this season because the last couple of seasons have been pretty deftly, <laughs> pretty deftly to say the least. So a bit of fun, a nice, comfortable season aided by teams around them imploding left, right and centre. I think that that really should be the sort of limit of the ambitions. But it is, it is a mad league. It is a mad league. And I think it's going to get a bit madder still because I think one or two teams might get points deductions before the end of the season to really throw the cat amongst the pigeons as well. So it's just a madhouse, as per, really. Oz, you heard it. We're going up this season, according to Dave. <laughs> I ignored everything after that. I completely disregarded and we're promoted. <laughs> yeah, obviously. I think Dave's very right in what he says and they pause that a good mid table without having to look over your shoulder or too far forward would be a decent season. Yeah, just just nice and steady, I think. Get get through Christmas. I do think in January a couple of clubs that are up there will gamble just because it is such a weird league this time and all it will take is 
you know, teams to think, right, you know, we're sat in top six. If we spend, you know, let's gamble, let's roll the dice and spend 20, 30 million, it'll probably result in, you know, in promotion. Um, I don't think Town has, if there's a, anywhere near that and I think it would probably do more harm than good if, if it did happen then you'd take it but you know the advice would literally be do not spend a single penny and and just bank it and, and come back down obviously the morale factor there is, is no good so yeah nice steady mid-table finish but it's just nice to be able to walk in you know to be walking down Leeds Road to a match and be like you know last two matches people have you know you have little chats with people what do you think score will be and it's like both both Blackburn and Luton. If it had been three nil to Town, three nil to Luton, you'd have come away thinking that's not too unexpected, just because it's so mental. It's you know, mm. similar with Blackburn, it could have been three nil either way, and you wouldn't have gone, wow, that was a shock. It, it could literally be out every week, and sometimes as a fan, that's a little bit more exciting than turning up mm. and knowing you're going to win every week. Certainly, obviously, <laughs> certainly better than turning up and knowing you're going to lose. Mm. So I think as fans, you just want to. People talk about being entertained at football, and I'm not one for harping on about wanting to be entertained. I, I want to go watch town and I want to see him win. You want him to get it for it, you do, Paul. So we yeah, hear every week. Playing 4 4 2 and knocking it long, <laughs> then that's how we do it. You know, I'm happy with that. If you can't, if you're not going to win, then at least enjoy the match. And like you said, Matt, at 2 all against Blackburn, if it had stayed like that, you'd have walked out and gone, yeah. you know what? We've gone in front, we've thrown mm. it away, but we've fought back and you know, we've, we've got it and then we've thrown it away again. But you know what? It was a, it was a decent Tuesday evening out. And, that as a fan, you, you accept that, don't you? Just show the fight, show the passion, show the commitment, and you know fans will generally be happy with that. Mm. There's a few there fans staying man. away. Don't there close up. Been reading other stuff today, like Birmingham got to a flyer. Lee Boyer's in. You know, here mm. we go, keep right on and all that. They're in free form, mate, and it's like they're thinking, here we go again, another relegation season and stuff. And it's interesting if you'd have thought, if you'd have watched that part a week ago, we were like, where's this gonna go? And Four points just kind of, and, and the way it's kind of happened is kind of arrested our the Chelsea Carlos career. roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah, and you look at other stuff, you're right where you say Sheffield United, exactly what I read that today. It's like, yeah, they lost just at Bournemouth, but they're playing really, you know, playing mm. well. They've kind of, you feel like they're going to kind of go in a run stuff and that as well. So I think that's the thing for me. It's just some of them games last year, obviously the Bournemouth one, maybe it's a bit naughty to pick that out because we had a few injuries, didn't we? But it's like, I want to know that when we click through the turnstiles, that we've got a chance every Saturday. And you should be able to say that in the championship, even at, even now where Fulham seems to have a bit of a, you kind of, what's the word? The, the we're definitely going, they probably will, but it's like, the oh, what's the word? They, you don't think you're going to get anything. And it's like, all of a sudden, that's been smashed out of the park. What's from, yeah, only the first defeat. So let's not get carried against a good start side. But you think now, anytime you can play, and this is the trouble where it's going to lure you in. So you think of our next two home games, Hull, and the aforementioned Birmingham, it's like, we're at home, full of poor, although good when you stay late on. It's like six points and blah, blah, But you should never think like that in this division and getting lured in and that as well. But fun, fans are going to turn up there, Paz. You're laughing, but they're going to turn up that ground a week on Saturday yeah, and, and expect that's three that's that's points. Good. Maybe that's a good thing. We should expect better standards than last few seasons, shouldn't we? We've got a better squad. Well, fandom, whatever club you're at, it's about hope. That's that's the thing. And like the the thing that's different this season is Carlos Corbin is a project manager and you're now a year and a bit into the project and you can start to hope a little bit because you can see things are different and you don't need a numbers guy like me or Steve Chicken to tell you that things are improving because you can see it on the pitch anyway. And that sense of hope is all any football fan asks for. And last season... You were 12th on New Year's Day and by the start of March, you were looking around at everybody else's results very nervously. And that's mm-hmm. that's not where town need to be. And I think that having that hope, I wrote in a piece, it's, it's not about, it's about allowing yourself to dream a little bit, but not demand too much. That's, that's the thing, because the dreaming and the hope is what gets people clicking through the turnstiles get people buying Sorba Thomas shirts because there's more and more of them now at every home game. And that's that's what you want, just a bit of goodwill, just a bit of excitement. And like you say, just feeling like you can go on a Saturday and it doesn't matter who's coming, you, you've got a fair you got a fair chance. You know what it is, Dave? I'm enjoying it again. You know, the last yeah. two years, I just, I think up until this season, I hadn't realised that how 
much I wasn't enjoying the football at certain points in the last couple of years. There was a little flurry here and there, Carlos, you know, sort of November, December. But after that and the year before under the Cowleys, really, and, and that's not a slight on Danny and Nicky Cowley. They had a job to do in turning around what was pretty much a sinking ship, but it wasn't fun to watch. And now it just feels like, it just feels like fun again. And I just hope that more people start coming back a little bit and see that it's actually it's pretty decent this at times. You yeah, know? it's funny to say that, Matt. Again, chucking more teams in it, but Middlesbrough, they're anti Warnock. I've seen a few mm. things recently. They lost to a bad full side yesterday. And it's expectations because obviously they were in the Premier League a lot more than us. And I know they've been a long time out of it, but they, I think they thought they were going to mix. We're talking like it's like April, but it's obviously only first yeah. international break. But things can change quick. But their expectations of playoff spots are or not. And it's like, that's what excites me. It's all right, Dave. It's just having that hope. And yeah, we've uh, and we've still got players to come back. And, you know, like Pippa, that's you know, like not being fit, Jordan Rhodes. We've not even seen him out being a township. So there's there's still plenty more to, to look forward to, really. And it would just be nice to see a few more of them empty seats filled that because Tuesday night seemed a poor crowd. Did they give 15,000? I read in one of my paper on Wednesday night. Like, sure. Bit of a yeah, Bradford City crowd, that wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Big, yeah. But, I did write on here in my in my notes because Cardiff and Birmingham three weeks ago were were, hail, were heralded as uh, heralded I should say as as playoff contenders and look where they are now sixteenth and twentieth. So oh, we've got that that article you know, I cut and paste to you today up on Football League paper kind of mentioned us. I'm like, whoa, don't, don't uh, be shocked. The, the no. championship can very quickly, swiftly yeah. give you mm. a kick in the balls, can if you get carried away with yourself. So you know. Did you yeah. predict Fulham this year? No. It's Mitrovic versus the world, mate, looking on that game Wednesday. It was unbelievable. I've never known a striker that's like, is too good for this division and just not good enough for Premier League. It's like Tom Ince used to be, isn't it? Tom Ince, when he had his pace yeah. before, he was a bit like that. And maybe Pritchard. Oh, right, guys. Go on, Dave. No, I was just going to say, but what, what what is important, really, in terms of what we've been talking about, the hope and everything else, is that last season, Huddersfield Town lost 21 games of football. And that's no fun whatsoever. And of those 21 games, nine of them were defeats followed immediately by another defeat. They've lost, I think it's, was it three times this season? And they've come back with a defeat in the game after. And that's massive because that, it stops everybody getting pulled down into the, into the, you know, into the quicksand, which is where Huddersfield Town fans have been for two years through no fault of their own. And COVID made it infinitely worse because not only was the football bad, it is awful watching on iFollow. <laughs> it made it <laughs> on, easy to stop following as well, yeah, didn't it? That's on, a, on a lot of levels, it's it's terrible watching on iFollow. Mm. So, yeah, just to have that little bit of hope back, and I just hope it does translate to the turnstiles turning over a little bit more. Mm. Right, let's move on a little bit. Cosy, you'll remember this. <laughs> Classic, classic Channel 4, eh? Uh, right, it's the news in brief. <laughs> the news, I know, I've been playing with this machine I, in, the, in the last sort of hour or so. Uh, news in brief. So a couple of things. Josh Ruffles became the 1,000th player to wear the blue and white stripes of Huddersfield Town uh, against Blackburn Rovers, which seems surprisingly low considering Lee Clark used about 150 players in three seasons. But, you know, congratulations to Josh and 1,000 players. Quite a, uh, quite a stat. Uh, Brahima Diara signed a new deal. Looking forward to seeing how he develops uh, over the coming months as well. Uh, Town women have beaten Stoke City 5-1 this weekend, so a big well done to them as they bounce back from a few defeats. And good luck to the new management team uh, over there as well for, for Huddersfield Town ladies. Uh, big congratulations as well to Sorba Thomas on his Welsh international call-up. Kiefer Moore, no doubt, will be licking his lips at the potential quality. Thanks for from Gareth Wyatt. Bale in it, so I've been told. Yeah, exactly. He's, colleagues. <laughs> he's knocked Gareth Bale out of the squad. Very well deserved this, isn't it, Poz? Yeah, he's cracking. He's a cracking player, he's uh, so. But I think unknown quantity, wasn't he? I don't even know if he were down to start at Derby, but obviously we no. you know, a few COVIDs and injuries and stuff like that. And he's, I think I said after after the Derby match that he played with at Derby, anyway, sort of that 
he's probably doing him a disservice actually. I don't really, I don't obviously don't mean to do it, but like a non-league mentality of when they get a ball, mm. I'm going to sort of try and score, <laughs> or I'm going to try and make something happen. There's no sort of nothing to lose is what you, like yeah. Technical, not you know, like we're well, better play square pass because that's what I've been told. It's very much I'm going to get on ball and I'm going to and I'm going to run and I'm going to do my step over and I'm going to show my skill and I don't really have any fear because, you know, I wasn't expected to be here and, you know, when he got called up for that well squad, um, you know, A, it was a massive shock because I didn't know if he could play for Wales and B, it was a massive shock because I thought, wow, the last, you know, he's been playing at Ballroom Wood and now, you know, he can be a potential international football. So, you know, he seems a really decent guy. I've met him a couple of times and um, really down to earth. You know, he's not, he's not come and Johnny come lately. And I noticed on his social media, we were back down where he grew up and he was doing a bit of filming in the, like the cage, you know, in where he used to play and stuff like that. So he's, you know, sort of true to his roots and stuff. And, you know, I think with someone like Thomas at the moment, the, the sky's the limit. And I think as fans, we've got to expect that he will have a dip in form. Like he's clearly not played league football for the season. And, you know, he will have a dip in form. And at that moment, we as... We have a, almost a responsibility in my eyes to, to keep behind him. And, you know, he, he seems the sort of player that thrives on confidence um, and stuff like that. So when, when the sort of going gets tough, which it will, I think we, we need to rally around him and, you know, bring him, and bring him back up. Um, but yeah, my little lad, um, our Jack, he's, he's a winger and he's, he's be sort of be sort of Thomas. You know, Dave, you mentioned about names on shirt. He, he got his shirt of the week and he's like, oh, so normally gets his own name. And he's like, no, 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 sort of the Thomas this time. Mm -hmm got um, posters up on, on his wall mm -hmm. and stickers that he's got from club shop and it, it just brings something different doesn't it? he excites you we've, mm -hmm. we've missed that at town there's not been anyone for the last since since Wagner years really that when he got the ball you thought oh you know something might happen here so yeah top top man and hopefully you know this form continues as long as it possibly can new what, song though Cosy what's been great with it mate and what I'd love to see so this weekend there's no games get to a non-league game man because this is where it happens and it's been absolutely beautiful to see Boreham Wood's Twitter feed. They, they've obviously, not, obviously, they, he's one of their owners this, as the song goes and the love and affection they've got for him and the pride that they had when he was announced, obviously, as uh, Rob Page, other still legend uh, in his squad on for the, you know, for the upcoming games. Brilliant. I, I love stuff like that because so much of players now are that we kind of see is kind of bought, bought in, you know, foreign players or, you know, kind of from... Premier League academies. This guy's come from Barham Wood, man, and it's been frustrating. Forget kind of opening the opening all woods. I thought it should have played a bit more kind of last season, but he's here now. And it, it's a brilliant story, Matt. And uh, no pressure, mate. Gareth Bale out and Sober Thomas in. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck, I think, I think last season, to be honest with you, I don't think he was quite ready. He's, he's 22 years old, so he's not come as like a sort of teenager. And he needed to just learn how to be a professional footballer. And I don't mean to be patronising about that, but it's stuff like swapping the fizzy drinks for water and various other things that you just need a little bit of help and guidance with more than anything else. But pre-season, he played on the right, he played on the left, he played as a false 10 in second half against Southport. He played uh, as a traditional winger. He played as an inverted winger. It felt a little bit like they didn't know quite what to do with him. But here was a guy who'd come back early for pre-season training, was clearly like making every effort he possibly could to get into the team. And his attitude is brilliant because last season, I mean, I, I've said it before on the other podcast, but he would come to every single game. If he wasn't selected in the squad, he'd be still on the sideline watching the warm-up. He'd be talking to coaches. He'd be talking to manager. If he was playing, he was the last one off after warming up. He was just... You could look at it and say, yeah, there's an attitude there of somebody who really, really wants to make it. And it's it's paying dividends now. I mean, he's in the Welsh international squad. He played three times for Boreham Wood in January. I mean, that's that's insane. He gets called up for Wales in September. So you've just got to sit back and ad admire what he's done in a very short space of time, really, and and enjoy him for what it is. You, you're seeing sort of, you know, a star in the making before your own eyes here. And enjoy that sober Thomas song as well, Cosy. <laughs> uh, right, so our final congratulations in our news round go to our very own Dan Porritt. 
described by his best mates as one of the tightest men on earth. Poz leaked a video of himself and son Jack celebrating against Reading online uh, in a ruse to get himself a free town shirt, which seemed to work, <laughs> which seemed to work a charm. Tell us about that day, Poz. Yeah, there were no, uh, there were no um, ulterior motives with that. So, uh, no, it was. Um, just got a message from club, just asking if we could pop down, and you know, utility had obviously picked up on the on the video, as, as many other people did, and um, they just wanted to to come down. And I think it was more the strap line of getting young young lads and young girls to go watch, you know, go watch live football rather than um, you know that that wouldn't be angle that I, I thought we were going to go down and. You know the importance of getting kids involved in going to watch live sport because you know it's all too easy these days to to pick a Man United or a Man City and you know have them as your club or sit on your PlayStation all day or whatever the, whatever the kids play on these days and um, you know do, I thought they just wanted to do a little piece on that but obviously when we when we got down there that Boozy were there doing his uh, doing his great uh, presentation skills and uh, you know stuff like that and the club club made a nice little video and you know they gave the the boys a, a shirt and, and obviously me as well so it were really unexpected and, and a really nice really nice touch because um you know they didn't have to do that at all they could have just used the video and you know put it on a promotional ad at youth twitter or whatever but to you know to get the people involved down there and uh, you know give them some give them something back were, were amazing and like i say my two boys have you know it's been buzzing ever since they, they keep talking about it our jack thinks he's a celebrity down there now you know, he knows <laughs> He knows Boothie, he knows Robin. He, he knows gave Boothie a Scarborough warning, didn't he, with that he shirt size? Right. <laughs> I'm like, all right, calm down. It's all right. It's too big. But I think that's one of the greatest things at Huddersfield Town. You know, we can we can come on here and we have at times, you know, give our two penneth on how the club's run and, you know, what can be done better on the pitch and off the pitch and stuff like that. But throughout that period at time, at town, the the, the community link to, to the fans and little bits and bobs like that is, is what makes the club what it is and you know that that means a lot does that to a, not just myself but to a to a lot of fans that the, the clubs still do that and there's a lot of a lot of good people down there like Robin and Rachel who work on you know support services and, and various others behind the scene involved in town foundation and stuff like that and they're they're a, they're a real credit to Woodersfield Town and they're the sort of people that you know we should sing their praises probably more often. You know, they're not involved in the football side of it. That's not their remit. So what goes on on the pitch don't matter to them. You know, it's not their doing. You know, but they do a lot of work with with the fans and in the community. And you know, absolutely every credit credit to those people. Matt, I felt under pressure on Tuesday with goal celebrations near pods because then cameras are there. I felt I had to. <laughs> I'm gonna. Yeah, I thought. Can we dig some of those out, pause, and we can we can show some videos, yeah. can't we, online of Cosy? Although to be fair, on Danny Ward's goal. Cause it did look like a, a spitting image of you, didn't it? In the background, celebrating that Danny Ward goal. Oh man, Pozza's gig, mate. I'm just we're just all mere mortals, mate. In a Pozza world, are <laughs> He is the super fan, isn't he? Oh, um, man. It's been like that since August. So it's no surprise to me, though. So, uh, what's next, Pods? Anyway, mate, is this pod going to be too big for you? Or I didn't, I didn't want to say, but you know, it's I'm your agent. Up front against Hull, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jack's on the wing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Right, so the last uh, item on our agenda, we we throw this back to you uh, again, Mr. Cosmalicus. Uh, you're on the couch and you're you're on the board on board with Tracy Couch as well, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, that, really interesting. So there's there's some, I think a lot of them misquote, but Minister of Football is going to like do some proposals, like so with you of kind of the kind of how we enjoy our football at the moment and that. So the one thing that they reckon is going to happen and. I don't know why it's going to have to be trial in lower divisions. It's not as if like they should do it, but is we drinking in stadiums and stuff, which uh, they reckon it's going to be trialed at non-league and league two level. And then if it's, you know, going to be successful, then, then it'll be come across everywhere. And that's why well. it's been really interesting kind of reading a lot of stuff recently because Man United and Liverpool are the kind of in their grounds are charging like two pound 90 for a pint. Because they've got a they've got a different system now to get people in the grounds. Because it's not like before you've got a sure I think obviously COVID vaccine pass or something like. But it's got a long story short that clubs are trying to get their income streams up, and it's, the, the article really interesting because it was saying a lot of local clubs are going to go under because they're losing a lot of money. So I think this is going to be welcomed by the clubs because obviously more kind of income in more pints and stuff like that. Something that feels kind of banged on about a little bit, you know, trying to get that, but. 
Well, I've got to be honest, Matt. I this is his controversial viewpoint, but I've seen it in rugby and yeah, it works well, doesn't Germany it? Germany and that as well. It's, it's a little bit different in Germany. I don't know. I think they're different with their beer, the Germans. It's almost do you, like. Do you remember when we had a friendly against Wakefield about 10, 11 years ago? And you, so, you could, did you know, you could drink uh, outside, you know, alongside the pitch and it, it didn't end well. There was a lot of fighting and, and it was, you know, a lot yeah. of drunken lads. Well, on and, Tuesday, Matt, in the South Stand, some guy, I don't know who he was, but some guys come down with a pint. No one's noticed him. So I've been drinking it in the second half and that as well. And, and typically when Ward scored, the beer get thrown in the air. So mm. it was kind of weird. It was almost like, <laughs> so I got a, covered in beer. But it's, like, it's, it's a one-off what I'm, I'm talking about. So it could, it could go great. Yeah. But, you know, well, you, just, all I'm thinking just is that the back of my mind. To come, mate. The, the kind of the argument for it is, you know, the good, normal, sensible fan, why shouldn't they be deprived of that? Because it's been, God, they were saying, was it 36 years since this has been able to be done and stuff like that as well. But mm. I see it in rugby league and it does get on my nerves, especially when you're in the seated areas, which obviously we are going to be at football. It's not too bad at terracing because you can move, but it's like people are, you know, you've got to move out and it's just like, Jesus Christ, this guy, is he here to watch pint or just watch the game or just to have as many pints as he can? And that's yeah, say so people are going to the toilet there. constantly. Don't get a, don't get an aisle yeah. seat, do you? You know, you know constantly... beer's going to get thrown, but... but well, there is that, but I th- we've got Dave on, obviously Dave on the podcast and, and Dave is a uh, it's no surprise to everyone that he is a seagull you know he is a, a brighton fan but what brighton do brilliantly through uh, mr barber down there is they uh they they have a match day experience which is a little bit unrivaled isn't it dave they open early they put music on don't they down there yeah. they, they do all sorts and this this kind of thing opens different uh opens different ideas and and different things that football clubs can do to be a bit more like brighton i guess so uh, the the thinking behind it is that basically if you you'll get less trouble if you a keep fans happier and b you don't have everybody just leave the ground straight after the game so you can come early so if you're in the away end they put local beer on so if Huddersfield Town were playing they'll they'll get a load of magic rock in for instance and then after the game they open up a couple of stands one of the stands they have like DJ live music in and it's open for like a couple of hours and you can have a drink rather than all crowding to the bars. They have people coming around with barrels so that you can buy a pint straight off from there. And it's just to basically it's a, it's a way for the club to make a load of money. It's a way to space the trains back out to Brighton better instead of having, you know, 22,000 people going for the same train 10 minutes after kickoff. And it just, it, it works because we can't do it in, sort of games against Crystal Palace or them as as we call them but for every other team you know they get they they get the red carpet rolled up and they can come come round and it's it's a good system and it works it works for us it helps that you know I'm I'm going to be honest with you it helps that our fan base is not a sort of historically chucking chairs around and all that middle sort class of thing. area isn't it well, it's it's not even that. It's just more that we've spent over seventy five percent of our entire history on the bottom two leagues. You, <laughs> we've had very little to fight about for a long time when we're too busy fighting in and amongst ourselves. So it's just about making that experience as as good as you can for away fans, offering a little bit of something after the game because you get a lot of away fans coming round who know about it and coming in and yeah it. it it works for us. It, I mean, I'm not sure it'd work everywhere. I'm not sure it'd work at London clubs for a, for an example, but there are ways football can look at itself and do things like this and clubs can generate money. And uh, looking at the match day experience is a, is a very key way to do it. And I think looking at the match day experience after the game is something that football clubs could do an awful lot more of as well, if I'm honest. Mm, During the game though, Matt, I just... Yeah, that's a different thing, isn't it? It's, mm. We'll see how it goes, I guess. But the uh, I think yeah. like it's happening, though, mate. It's I think it'll be interesting to see if he gets resistance from police and what have you. But again, like Dave's mentioned in the theory of why they do what they do at Brighton, but they were kind of saying it's going to stop people like binge drinking, kind of, you know, for the game. Right, yeah, yeah. See, because they get um, three pints at half time, don't they? And down they go and back out, I'm yeah. Debatable with some guys that I know, and especially if town start playing crap, it's like beers are... Flying left, right. It does annoy me a little bit. I mean, I'm will a bit st- older. But will like, it stop you from leaving after 20 minutes at Tottenham, Cosy, and things like that? <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> that, but yeah. Next I think season, when we've got up, mate, I'll tell you. But no, it's, uh, I, it's happening, it is, though, I think. 
It's worth saying, though, that it was banned for a very good reason. It wasn't like somebody just took their bat and ball home and said football fans shouldn't be able to have a drink and watch the game. It was like football stadiums were the wild, wild west, to say the very, very least. And I think it, I think you almost have to judge it from a club to club basis, because I think some clubs could do it tomorrow and there would be no problems whatsoever and it'd be absolutely fine. Fulham in the championship could do it tomorrow and everybody would sit and have a pint and watch the game and it'd go absolutely fine. But I, could you really see it being successful with Millwall, for example? You know, it I think point, Dave, because when when it did, I remember some of them games. Stuff's coming back to me now, but there used to be games where away fans were banned from drinking at mm-hmm. half time, even that concourse. And I'm sure we got. What, did we go to Ellen Road? Yeah, we know. That's why. That's why Leeds is pretty much a twelve o'clock kickoff when when they used to come here yeah. and the pubs pubs were shut in the town centre mm-hmm. and things like well, that. Yeah. Where, we were like we were going places like, oh, you can't have a drink and stuff, but. It's going to be fascinating to see how it happens because I was really shocked with the off because normally it's not, oh, is it just an article that's just kind of mm. guessing and, oh, oh, this would be nice to add like we have in Bundesliga. But no, it sounds like it's going to be happening. National League, League 2, the tribes on. Because you can't even do it in non-league. I went to Altingham last week and some guys must have like Man United fans about they're piling into sidelines like with this. Oh, no, lad, you can't take it off. What? It's non-league. No. So you can't even have a drink at the sidelines in non Well. At kind of fifth tier level, I don't know any lower than that, but I don't think you can at Scarborough either. But so this will be groundbreaking stuff and welcome to buy many. But as someone who like goes and watches a lot of rugby and people like, man, this is your eighth pint now, do I have to move again? It's like, yeah, seal's but, gone. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Like, if you can afford to, to buy eight pints inside a stadium, you're obviously doing all right. And I certainly won't be paying. Here he is, time. tightest man alive. And Magic so, Rock, you've just bigged him up at Star Pods. Now you're sticking needle in, man. <laughs> It's all right if it's free, isn't it? I think oh, it's free. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's it is an interesting one, and you know, if they roll it out and and fans decide to spoil it, then we, we've only got ourselves to blame, haven't we? We can't sort of half on about it's not seventies and eighties anymore. We're a different breed, and we we do things differently. And then when it comes in, ruin it for ourselves. A little bit like say standard in it in a way. It'll probably drip feed in and 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 see how it goes. And you know that seems to have worked really well, and a lot more clubs are getting involved with with safe standing. So. You know, it may, it may be certain areas in stadiums that are allowed it at first. You know, I'm thinking at town, maybe Riverside Stand would probably be more suitable than maybe Cowshed. Um, <laughs> yeah, Matt, you upper class. I know. Chardonnay where we <laughs> sit, you know, and none of this none, none of this beer malarkey, you know, it's high class wine, you know, and gins and what have you. <laughs> Uh, right, I think that's it for this week, guys. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for for coming on to the uh, to the podcast. Um, love the stuff that you do in the the examiner and and also the book as well. Surely it's about time Silver Linings has a, an audio book, isn't it? Well, to be honest with you, the thought of sitting there for eight hours reading my own book <laughs> could you not get <laughs> could you not get someone famous to do it? There's um... Pos. Yeah, yeah, Pos. Yeah, there you go. Pos could do it. There you that go. Is, well, uh, Get a copy of the book, I'll do it for you, mate. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, you pause, you might be tied up because they're looking for a new bond, aren't they? Now, oh, yeah, <laughs> ginger bond, <laughs> double ogre double seven. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That is a great uh, way guys. to end. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it, guys. So, Dave, thank you for coming on. Cozzy, pause, top lads, as always. And uh, we'll be back again next week. Thank you, guys. Cheers, guys. Cheers. There's a team that is dear to its followers The colours are bright, blue and white They're a team of renown They're the pride of the town And the game of football is their delight And all while upon the field of play Thousands loudly cheer them on the way Often you can hear them say Who can be the town today? And then the bells will ring so merrily 
death Rico shall be a memory so town play up and bring that car back to Huddersfield so town play up and bring the car back to Huddersfield